Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and we're going to dive into 2 Kings 22. Father God, we come before you, and Lord, we have just sung about the living hope that you are. Father, there are many among us right now who need just that hope. Not a stale hope, not a stagnant hope, not a future hope, Lord. They need a living hope in their life right now. Father, thank you for reminding us that you are the hope that we seek and are searching for, that you are all the hope that we need. And Father, may our hearts desire nothing more than that hope. Lord, bless us now as we open your word. May it speak to our lives and to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. In our small groups this week, we're going to be talking about the importance of disciples, all disciples, putting effort into learning about Jesus. We've talked about uh, blessing people. We've, that's the first habit. We've talked about eating with people. We're going to skip ahead and kind of skip a chapter this week. We're going to come back to listen, but we're going to do learn this week. And so this week we're talking about being committed and having a habit where, where we are learning about Jesus. The author of Surprise the World uh, writes this, Frost writes on page 72 of his book, speaking of Jesus, he says, we need to know him if we're going to share him as the reason for the hope that we have. It's hard to share about something you don't know about, isn't it? Have you ever tried to share about something you didn't know about? It's not an easy thing to do. If, if we want to share Jesus, we have to know Jesus. If we want to share about the hope, the living hope that we have in our lives, we have to know what that hope is and where it comes from. It's hard to share about something that you don't know. If I asked you, for example, to, to join me on stage and I handed you a microphone and, and I said, can you give us a 30-minute lecture on quantum physics? <laughs> I, I highly suspect probably none of us could do that. Because it's hard to share about something you don't know. Or if I were to hand you that microphone and say, could, could you give us a 30-minute lecture on dark matter and black holes in the universe? Most of us couldn't do three minutes, much less 30, right? Because we just don't know much about it. If I asked you to come up here and, and we brought the big whiteboard out and I handed you some dry erase uh, markers and an eraser and a microphone... And I said, could you explain to us over the next 45 minutes, calculus derivatives? <laughs> Probably none of us could, right? We would stumble and we would struggle. It's not because we don't know about black holes. It's not because we've never heard of quantum physics or dark matter. It's not because none of us never took calculus. Most of us, many of us, at some point in our journey through the education system probably did take calculus and were exposed to derivatives and had some experience with them at somewhere along the way. It's just that we don't know them enough to share them, do we? At least not at this point in our lives. Now, if I asked you to come up here on stage and I handed you a microphone and I said, hey, could you tell us what you do at work every day? Hopefully you can explain that, <laughs> right? You wouldn't have to think about it. Shouldn't make you real nervous. Like you, you would just be able to do it because you know what you do at work every day. Or if I brought you up here and said, hey, tell us about your family. Tell us about your kids. Tell us about your wife. Tell us about your parents. Tell us about your childhood, when you, how you grew up. You could go on and on and on about those things because you know those things. If, if I asked you to come up here, if, for those of you who've been married 20, 30, 40, 50 years, and said, hey, give us some insights into what makes a healthy marriage, what's made it last, how you've gotten through the hard times. Many of you could share about that because you've been there, you've done that, you, you know it. And those are hard things too. <laughs> hey, being married for 20, 30, 40, 50 years takes a lot more skill than doing quantum physics or reading a book about black holes or, or you know, doing calculus derivatives. There are calculators that can do it if you just know how to plug it in. Being married is a lot harder 
than that. See, here, here's the point. The point is we can talk about and explain things we know about. It's not that we're not smart enough to learn about quantum physics or black holes or not smart enough to learn how to do derivatives. Of course, of course we could. It's just that we don't know them. You're smart enough to do it. You just don't know them, and so it's hard to explain something you don't know. Church, we need to know Jesus if we're going to share Jesus with the world. We need to know what the living hope of God is if we're going to share that living hope with the world. I want to expand on that idea that Frost had in his book today, and we're going to come to a great passage of Scripture in 2 Kings 22. And, and I want to expand this out to needing to be in and, and committed to the Word of God. The reality is many Christians, perhaps even most Christians, really don't know that much about the Bible because they don't read the Bible. It's not that you're not smart enough to know what's in the Bible. It's just you don't know what's there because you've, you've never read it. Or you read it so infrequently or exposed to it so infrequently that it's hard to really know what's there because you're never in it. According to LifeWay Research, only 11% of Americans read their Bible consistently. Now, they define consistently for this study four times a week. 11% of Americans that they polled said they read their Bible consistently. As a part of this study, they, they asked people to self-identify if they were disciples of Jesus, if they were Christians, if they faithfully attended church. And you know what they found? They found that only 5% of self-professing disciples of Jesus who faithfully attended church, only about 5% read their Bible every day, seven days a week. That means 95% aren't. Another study found that there are many positive impacts for an individual's life when they're in the Word of God. And there are different studies, and these percentages change. But if you look at them in aggregate, you'll notice that many of them share uh, the same kinds of things and the same kinds of percentages. So for example, this one particular study I read this week said that those who feel lonely drop by 30% if they read the Bible every day. People with anger issues, their anger issues drop by 32% when they're reading the Bible every day. Bitterness and jealousy in relationships drop by 40% among those who read the Bible every day. Alcoholism drops by 57% for those who read the Bible every day. Sex outside of marriage drops by 68% for those who read the Bible every day. People who said they felt spiritually stagnant drops by 60% when they read the Bible every day. Viewing pornography drops by 61%. It should be 100%, but that flesh is hard to beat, man. 61% though, that's nothing to, to, to not be happy about, drops by 61% for those who read the Bible every single day. Sharing your faith with other people jumps. It increases by 200% if you're reading your Bible every single day. Having a desire and a willingness and actually going out and discipling another person goes up 230% among those who read their Bibles every single day. But even knowing that we should read the Bible, and even knowing that reading the Bible is beneficial, still, most Christians don't do it. It leads us to our big idea for today. The big idea is this. It's a version of Frost's big idea for his chapter this week. Changing it just slightly says this, you can't tell people God's ways if you don't know God's word. You can't tell people about the ways of God if you don't know the word of God. I want to give you four reasons why that's true today, four reasons why you should make a commitment to read God's word. The first one is this, through God's word, God reveals himself to us. He reveals himself to us. He reveals so much through his word. He reveals his plans. He reveals his will for our lives. He reveals his character. God reveals his power through his word and so much more. But the thing I really want you to grasp today and see is this, that God reveals himself through the word of God. 
Look at our text in 2 Kings 22. There's some context here. You probably need a little bit of context here. So um, this, this isn't a super familiar text for most believers. What you need to know is this. Judah has had a series of really bad kings. In fact, most of the kings who oversaw Judah throughout its history were bad kings. They only had a couple of good ones. Josiah, the, the guy we're going to read about today, is one of the good ones. Josiah becomes king at the age of eight. How many of you wouldn't let your kids stay home by themselves at the age of eight? <laughs> this dude is the king of Judah at the age of eight. And he's going to be counted among one of the good kings of Judah. But before he became king, there were two previous kings who, the combination of the two, ruled about 77 years, and they were really awful bad kings. The first one was a guy by the name of Manasseh. He ruled about 55 years. The other was a, a guy by the name of Ammon, and uh, he ruled about 22 years. So during those 77 years, a lot of bad stuff was happening. I wish we had time to go highlight some of it, but we just don't. And at some point in those 77 years, or perhaps even before that, the people were separated from the word of God. So they, they decide they're going to go through the temple. They're looking for some silver and some other stuff. They're doing some things in the kingdom. Josiah's a good king, and he sends people to go through the temple. And, and that's where we pick the story up. In 2 Kings 22.8, it says, The high priest... Hilakiah told the court secretary, Saphon, I found the book of the law in the Lord's temple. And he gave the book to Saphon to read it. Then the court secretary went to the king and reported, Your servants have emptied out the silver that was found in the temple and have given it to those doing the work, those who oversee the Lord's temple. And then the court secretary told the king, The priest has given me a book. And Saphon read it in the presence of the king. And then look at verse 11. It says, When the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. Now again, we don't know how long the word of, the God, the word of God, the word of the law, the book of the law was lost. We don't know. But we do know that everybody's surprised to find it. The priest was surprised to find it. The scribe was surprised to find it. The king is surprised. It appears from the text that none of these guys have ever read it before. None of them are familiar with it. None of them really know what it is. They stumble across it in the temple while they're looking for other things. None of them even seem to know that it even existed. But you know who the one person who wasn't surprised was? God. And these people find this book in the temple and they open it and they start reading it and God immediately starts to reveal himself to them through the book of the law. He starts to, in many ways, reintroduce himself to his people through his word. Think about how this changed everything. Reminds me of Proverbs 27.1. Proverbs 27.1 has a lot of application for a lot of contexts, and I think this is one of them. It's the verse that says, don't boast about tomorrow because you don't know what a day might bring. One day, these guys know nothing about the law. They don't even know it exists. The next day, they find it, they read it, and their lives are being changed by it because God is revealing himself to them almost instantly when they pick it up and start reading it. God didn't just reveal a scroll to these guys. He didn't just reveal some letters on some parchment to these guys. He didn't just reveal a set of rules or a set of laws to them. He's revealing himself, and they are being personally impacted by it. I, I don't know who in here reads their Bible every day. I don't know who in here reads their Bible once a week or twice a week or four times a week. I don't know if you're doing it or not. But God knows if you're doing it or not, and you know if you're doing it or not. I have a, I have a hunch that there's many of us who, who want God to reveal himself to us, and one of the reasons we're not feeling like God is revealing himself to us is because we're not spending any time in his word. Statistically speaking, the studies show that the overwhelming majority of Christ followers rarely read the Bible or the words of Christ. 
Church, there are many, many reasons to read God's Word. There's not just a few. There's a lot. But one of the most impressive and one of the most important in my mind is this. If you want God to reveal himself to you, if you want God to reveal his plan for your life, his purpose for your life, if you want God to reveal his will to you, if you want want God to reveal himself to you, then you need to open the word of God. And you need to spend time in it. There's no doubt about that in my mind. Because it's through the word that he reveals himself to us, so we need to be committed to it. There's a second reason we should learn the Word of God. There's a second reason we should learn Jesus, as Frost puts it. It's because God renews through His Word. Let's keep reading in verse 13. And I want you to see the renewed spirit that invades these people as God reveals Himself to them. There's this renewed sense of purpose, a renewed hope, a renewed joy. Church, the word of God will renew you if you'll be committed to read it. Look at what this young king says in verse 13. He says, Go and inquire of the Lord for me, for the people and for all of Judah about the words of this book that has been found. For great is the Lord's wrath that is kindled against us because our ancestors have not obeyed the words of this book in order to do everything written about us. He realizes at his young, tender age that because of what his ancestors have done, God is going to have to punish them. And he says, go inquire about this. Go figure this out. Like, we're going to get this straight. God is revealing himself to us. And I want to know more about this. So he dispatches five of his most trusted people to go find out what all of this means. And they're quickly renewed. We're going to come back into 22, but for just a minute, I want you to jump ahead to 2 Kings 23. In 2 Kings 23, starting in verse 1, it says this. So the king sent messengers, and they gathered all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem to him. And then the king went to the Lord's temple with all the men of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, as well as the priests and the prophets and all the people from the youngest to the oldest. He read it in their hearing and all the words of the book of the covenant that had been found in the Lord's temple. Next, the king stood by the pillar, and he made a covenant in the Lord's presence to follow the Lord and to keep his commands and his decrees and his statutes with all of his heart and with all of his soul in order to carry out the words of this covenant that were written in this book. And all the people agreed to the covenant. So the king gets everybody out of bed for this one. Everybody in the kingdom comes. Everything in the kingdom stops. All the leaders are there, all the people are there, all the residents of Jerusalem are there, all the priests, the scribes, the holy people, the prophets, they're all there. All the people, it says, from the youngest to the oldest are there, and they read the word of God together. And several translations translate verse 3 a little bit different than the one I just read you. Several translations put it like this in verse 3. It says, the king stood by the pillar and he renewed the covenant before the Lord. And all the people renewed the covenant before the Lord. They use that word renewed because what God did was he revealed himself They got a glimpse of God's glory and God's greatness and God's grace and his generosity. And they said, we want to be with you even if that's harder. And even if that hurts. And even if that means that we have to be disciplined. We want to be with you. We don't want to go if you're not going. We don't want to do it if you're not in it. We want to be with you. God had renewed the hope of his people to that point where they were saying, we're going to renew this covenant with you. They had gotten some bad news. We're going to get to that in a minute when we go back into 22. They knew God wasn't going to change his mind or relent over what he had said. But they still were so renewed by the word of God, their faith, their hope, their spirit was so renewed that they wanted to renew that covenant with God. Church, if you want to be renewed daily or hourly or minute by minute sometimes, read God's word. It will renew you like nothing else can. You probably don't even need a vacation. You just need to get in God's word. I'm serious. 
You don't need a trip to Hawaii. You just need to go sit on the back porch, sit with God, and read his word. And it will renew your faith, your hope, your energy, your spirit, your motivation. Like you have never experienced, give it a try. Through it we learn, and through it we are renewed. And we renew our commitment to God when we read it. If you want to be renewed, make time to learn from the Lord. I love the way the psalmist put it, Psalm 19, 7 through 8. The instruction of the Lord is perfect, no surprise there. And then he says, renewing one's life. The testimony of the Lord is trustworthy, making the inexperienced wise. The precepts of the Lord are right, making the heart glad. The command of the Lord is radiant, making the eyes light up. God's word and his instructions renew our life. Paul reminded us of the power of God's word in our personal lives when he wrote to Timothy. In 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, he said, All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. If you want to be complete, equipped, renewed for the work of God, then spend time in God's word. Learn from the Lord. Learn from the Spirit. Learn who God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are. Learn what the church is about. Learn the ways of Jesus. It's impossible to share his ways if we don't know his ways. And we learn his ways by being in his word. Number three, God relates to us through his word. This is probably super obvious, and I, I bet 99.9% .9 of you already know this. But I'm going to say it just in case there's one here who doesn't. There may be one person who just needs to hear this today, and so I'm going to say it. God loves you. You cannot imagine or fathom how much he loves you. He cares about you. He loves you. He wants to communicate with you. He wants to have a relationship with you so much that he sent his son Jesus to die on a cross for you. He loves you. He is pursuing you with everything he has. And many times the way God relates to us is through his word. So we should be in God's word and we should be learning God's word and be learning Jesus daily. Look at what happens. They find the word of God. He reveals himself. They go through this process and as a part of that, he renews his people. They renew their covenant. And then we can also see in this text how he's relating to them through the word. Look at 2 Kings twenty-two fifteen. She said to them, this is what the Lord God of Israel says, Say to the man who sent you to me. Say to the man who sent you to me. Have you ever wanted God to say something to you? Raise your hand if you've ever wanted God to speak and say something. Amen. If you want God to say something to you, get in the Word. If you want God to speak to your heart, read the Bible. If you want to hear from God, read the Word. If you want to be able to relate to God and to understand God and to know God, read the holy word of God. If you want to know what God says about a topic or a subject or a situation or a problem, read the word. <coughs> read it. Look down at verse 16. I want you to notice when you come to the Lord and <clears throat> you get in his word, it's not always going to make you feel warm and fuzzy on the inside. It's not always going to be good news. The Lord loves you, but he'll love you enough to be honest with you. And sometimes the Lord will convict you and the Lord will challenge you. And sometimes, and I'm going to use this word, and I know it's a dirty word for a lot of people, but I'm going to use it here in church. It's a D word. Sometimes you will be disciplined by God. And that's okay. 
Look at verse 16. Look at what happens. This isn't warm and fuzzy. This is what the Lord says. I'm about to bring disaster on this place and on its inhabitants, fulfilling all the words of the book that the king of Judah has read. Because they have abandoned me and burned incense to other gods in order to anger me with all the work of their hands, my wrath will be kindled against this place, and it will not be quenched. Say this to the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord. This is what the Lord God of Israel says. As for the words that you heard, because your heart was tender, and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that they would become a desolation and a curse, and because you have torn your clothes and wept before me, I myself have heard. And this is the Lord's declaration. Therefore, I will indeed gather you to your ancestors, and you will be gathered to your grave in peace. Your eyes will not see all the disaster that I'm bringing to this place. Then they reported to the king. Again, sometimes when we come to the word, or we come to God, or we hear from his word, it's going to give us unpleasant news. Sometimes it's going to challenge us or discipline us. Sometimes it's going to make us uncomfortable. But that shouldn't mean we turn away from it or we reject it or we discredit it. That's what so many people do. When they come to the Word and they read something they don't like, they just go, well, that's for somebody else. Well, that was for them back then. Or, you know, that's for people like that over there. That's for people who do those kinds of things. I don't do those kinds of things, so that doesn't really apply to me. They, they, they try to discredit it or sweep it aside. Or they just outright reject it and say, no, I ain't going to do that. I'm not going to accept that. I'm not going to believe that. Church, can I just tell you, if God's word is going to change you, it has to be able to challenge you. If you're going to let God change you, then you better be open to God challenging you. Because if you never let God challenge you, if you never let God's word challenge you, it's never going to change you. God spoke these words through this oracle, through another person, but it all happened because Josiah chose to be committed to the word of God. He said, no matter what, we know what the book says, we know what's going to happen, we know what you're going to do, but we've renewed our covenant with you. We are going to stand fast and stand strong, and and we are going to follow you no matter what it means. He was was there, and he said, I'm going to stand here even if you have something tough to say to me. He was committed to God and committed to his word, and that's the way we should be. God revealed himself to Josiah through the word. He renewed Josiah and the nation through the word. And now he's relating to them because he's choosing to be totally committed to the word. And God's saying, I'm going to tell you exactly how this is going to be. I'm going to relate this to you exactly in the way it's going to happen. And I'm going to show you exactly what you're facing. There's a fourth and final reason. We should read the word, and reading the word is important. It's because God rescues us through his word. I know what some of you are thinking. Some of you are going, huh. See, we live in an age where you guys all have iPhones and iPads, and y'all are sitting there reading commentaries by people way smarter than me about this stuff as I'm preaching it. We have retired pastors and missionaries in our church. We have Bible students who've been in small groups and Bible studies a long time, and y'all have read this, and you know where this is going And you're thinking, rescue? God destroys them. He does. You're right. 605 B.C., a really bad dude by the name of Nebuchadnezzar comes along, makes his first attack on Jerusalem, and desolation happens just like God said it would. But church, here's what I want you to see. Like Sometimes we have such a short-sighted view of things. God sees it all. What I want you to see is they won't be defeated forever. Victory is coming Salvation is coming. Their divine rescue is on the way. And because these people found the word, read the word, allowed God to reveal himself to them through the word, they were willing to renew their covenant and God renewed them through the word. God related it all to them in a way they could understand it and they could understand him because all of that has happened. The turnaround for this nation 
has already started because they decided they were going to commit to the word of God. God can, and many times God does rescue us through his word. The psalmist said in Psalm 18, starting in verse 30, God, his way is perfect. No surprise there. The word of the Lord is pure, and he is a shield to those who take refuge in him. He protects us. He rescues us. For who is God besides our Lord? Who is a rock? Only our God. God, he clothes me with strength and makes my way perfect. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer, and he sets me securely on the heights. Or Psalm 107, verse 19, which says, Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He saved them from their distress. He sent his word and healed them. He rescued them from their traps. Let them give thanks to the Lord, for he is faithful in his love and his wondrous works for all humanity. He sent his word and healed them. Church, God's word is able to rescue us from so much if we'll be committed to it, if we'll read it, if we'll learn it. If you need to be rescued from an addiction or if you need to be rescued from guilt or if you need to be rescued from shame or depression or anxiety or lust or anger or any one of 10,000 other things that you might need a rescue from, can I just tell you the word of God is a great place to start. And the word of God has the power to finish it. Maybe you need to be rescued from sin, from sin itself. The biggest, greatest, most devastating enemy to all humanity, sin. In John chapter 5, verse 24, Jesus said this. He said, truly, I tell you, anyone who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not come under judgment, but has passed from death to life. Anyone who hears my word and believes him who sent me. That's the power of the word of God set free from sin, and has eternal life. Jesus says, that's all it takes. Hear my word and believe him who sent me, and you have eternal life and will not come under judgment. And you have passed from death to life. Church, commit yourself to God's word. He will reveal himself to you. He will renew you. He will relate to you. And he will rescue you. We don't have time to follow the elaborate rescue plan all the way through the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation as I had planned to do. But I do very quickly just want to take you to John chapter 1 in the New Testament and I want you to get a glimpse into the big picture and how the word plays a part in all of it. In John chapter 1 verses 1 through 5 it says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and all things were created through him, and apart from him not one thing was created that has been created. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness, and yet the darkness did not overcome it. If you have your Bibles, jump to verse 14 in John chapter 1, where it says this, The Word word became flesh and dwelt among us. We observed his glory. The glory is the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Who was John talking about here when he says the word, Jesus? Here's what I want you to see. Through Jesus, God revealed himself to humanity. He sent Jesus from heaven to earth in the flesh and revealed himself to us. Through Jesus, God renewed his people. Parables, miracles, teachings, all of the things that Jesus did renewed the hope of the people of God. Through Jesus, God related to his creation, to his people. Again, in the flesh, he faced every sin you and I do and yet did not sin even once. God related to us as a man through the flesh of Jesus who was God. And through Jesus, God rescued humanity from sin. He took his one and only son, put him on a cross, crushed him under the weight of sin, so you and I could be forgiven by the blood of Jesus. 
Church, there is only one name under heaven by which you can be saved, and his name is Jesus. Jesus is the Alpha and Jesus is the Omega. Jesus is the first and Jesus is the last. Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And he is the Word who became flesh and dwelt among us. He is the one who died for you. He is the one, the only one, who can set you free today. If you're here and you're not saved, I pray that God will reveal himself today through this word, that he will renew your spirit, that he is related to you in a way that you can tell that he wants to rescue you this hour from your sin through the power of his son, and that you will believe, confess, repent, and respond to the goodness and the grace of God. Let's pray together. We're not going to ask you to walk an aisle to raise a hand. Not going to beg and plead with you. Not going to do any evangelistic tactics or tricks. You know if it's you. You know if you're a sinner in need of a Savior. You know if the Holy Spirit is calling your name. You cannot deny the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is moving in your life and you need to repent and believe this hour. We ask you just to pray with us. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life and the only one at that. If that's you, say this, Lord, it's me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I know that I have messed things up and gone astray. So I ask now by faith that you would change me from the inside out. Lord, I ask by faith that you would forgive me. I ask by faith that you would make me new. Lord, I thank you for your grace and for your goodness. I thank you for your generosity and for your love. I thank you for saving me this day. Father, as we close this hour, we thank you for the living hope that we have through your word, through your son, through Jesus. A living hope that far exceeds our expectations, a living hope that far outweighs our momentary pain and suffering and troubles and trials and tragedies that befall us upon the sinful world. Lord, a living hope that overcomes all things a living hope that can see us through all things. So Lord, I pray now for these who have gathered here faithfully to worship you today. Lord, I know they love you. They're not here because it was convenient. They're not here because it's popular. They're not not here because there wasn't somewhere else they could go or something else they could do. They're here because they love you. They long for you. They desire to know you. Lord, I pray you bless them. Bless their families, their marriages, their kids, their businesses. And Lord, I pray you would bless their time in your word this week. Hey, thanks for joining us here on YouTube or social media uh, for this message. We pray that God uses it to bless your life. If you don't mind, hit the subscribe, the follow, the like, the thumbs up button. Uh, Leave an encouraging comment down below. It's so encouraging for us to hear how this is impacting you wherever you may be. And if you have a prayer request, we'd love to pray for you with that as well. You can submit those by going to our website, cowboyfellowship.org. We pray that this blesses you. Thanks for being a part of our online family.